Hey guys, how's it going? So, I'm trying out something new today. I'm calling it, I think, D&D-O Shorts, where I'm taking a question that I seem to be getting asked frequently, sort of like my sliding into the DMs, um, but it's maybe a little bit more just sort of crunchy and numbery focused. Um, that are sort of quick responses that maybe don't deserve an entire episode slash build um, that we can just kind of have a quicker conversation about. And um, yeah, and you know, they're, they're questions that, that I kind of see popping up semi-regularly, uh, or at least that I've had a number of times and wanted to address and have a little chat about. Um, so welcome to d and O Shorts, uh, number one. Before I jump into what I wanted to talk about, um, I'm also sort of guinea pigging you guys a little bit with my new system and setup, um, playing around with uh, new software and a new camera. And um, I, I got the flip thing so that my mole's on the right side uh, taken care of. And you know, I'm hoping that the image quality is better but I have noticed that sometimes there's a little bit of video tearing um, because of it, and I'm assuming that it's just because my rig can't handle um, the increased quality, so I might need to look at upgrading my system, but that's a longer-term goal. Anyway, if you wouldn't mind, do a comparison on this to maybe last or earlier this week's video and maybe you know previous week's videos, and let me know you know, what you think when you do a comparison to the image quality, especially if you are a video file um, kind of person, and it would really help me out. I just made a setting adjustment. Tell me if you can notice a difference. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for being my guinea pigs and, and uh, giving me feedback. Anyway, the question that I wanted to discuss today, two-weapon fighting. I've had a lot of people ask, can you optimize a build for two-weapon fighting and or can two-weapon fighting compete with or be as good as or better than um, two-handed weapon fighting? Great weapon fighting, right? Your great swords, your battle, your great axes, those kinds of things. Um, for some reason, for whatever reason, um, I've always had a preference, a bias myself towards two-weapon fighting. I think it stems from Knights of the Old Republic um, I would always play a character that um, had two lightsabers, and that just felt really cool because I could be two different colors, and I loved sort of the finesse, acrobatic-y style of, of using two weapons. Um, here's the problem. I think the quick answer, the short answer generally, and for the most part, is no. The way that D&D 5e works and is set up um, particularly thanks to the polearm master feet and the great weapon master feet and the way that they work so well together. I think it's almost, with maybe one exception, impossible to get two weapon fighting um, on par, sustain, sustained damage wise, to someone using um, a two handed weapon. So, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the thing, in theory, that two-weapon fighting has over using a two-handed weapon, right, is more attacks. Because you can make an attack with your main hand and an attack with your offhand, and thereby you get more attacks, right? And so maybe if you could find a way to add damage to every attack that you do, two-weapon fighting might find a way to get an edge. Unfortunately, there exists a feat as you all know, called the polearm master, which lets you use a polearm, which is a heavy two-handed weapon. Granted, it's only a D10, those halberds and pikes, right? And not your D12 that a great axe would do, or 2D6, even slightly better, that a great sword would do. It's only a D10, but because of the way the polearm master feet, it lets you take an attack on your bonus action. Um, and so that kind of negates that sort of advantage that using two weapons might bring. Not only that, but it lets you take that bonus action attack and apply your you know, strength modifier, as it were, without having to take a fighting style, two weapon fighting, 
you know you don't get your you don't get your strength or dexterity modifier when you're making that offhand attack unless you take the fight the two weapon fighting fighting style. So instead you use a two-handed weapon with a polearm master feat and you as a bonus action get to make an attack. It's only a d4, but d10, d4 um, and you get to add uh, add your strength modifier and thereby negating any advantage really that the two weapon fighter may have had even if they take the two weapon fighting style right because now you get the same amount of attacks using a great weapon or a two-handed weapon as the guy or gal using two weapons at a time would right same number of attacks um, with with essentially the same num the same amount of damage when you roll the dice and add to that so so you add to that the fact that people using a two-handed weapon a heavy weapon can then also take the feat um, the great weapon master and that's what really um, turns the tables as it were in favor of the two-handed weapon user because they get you know at the cost of a minus five to hit admittedly to add 10 damage to every attack that they make and somebody using two weapons there there is no feat that when you crunch the numbers will add up to that level of damage right um, what two weapon wielders get is the dual wielder feat which just lets you instead of use two weapons that are a d6 of damage each a short sword or something that's light right use a different one-handed weapon that's not necessarily light like a rapier or a longsword and that's just a d8 and going from 2d6 you know a d6 and a d6 to a d8 and a d8 is is just one damage one extra damage per weapon and it just it doesn't add up it does not compare granted if you take the dual wielder feat you get a bump to your armor class too so you know you gotta weigh that at some point right but when we're talking pure damage um, it's pretty much impossible, with one exception, um, for a two-weapon user to match up damage-wise. Um, and you can crunch the numbers and see it for yourself. Now, some may argue, um, well, what about rogues? Rogues get sneak attack damage, and in order to get sneak attack damage, you have to use a light finesse weapon, right? Uh, not light, but a finesse weapon. So rapiers would also work. Um, and and if you're using a, a, a two-handed weapon, for the most part, that is not going to work, right? At least if you're using that great weapon master feat, you're not going to be able to get sneak attack damage. So can you com become competitive by maybe subclassing into rogue or just going rogue and getting that sneak attack damage? And the short answer is no. It, it doesn't. It doesn't measure up. Um, you can crunch the numbers. So, you know, the question becomes, well, when do you take the rogue dip? If you go full rogue, you're not going to be getting that extra attack that, you know, fighters and barbarians and things get. And, and if you crunch the numbers, it's going to fall behind for that reason. Um, but then you could multi-class and maybe you go five levels of fighter and then some rogue levels to get that sneak attack damage. And then are you going to be able to be competitive? Um, no. So just to illustrate the point, let's look at some numbers. Um, the, the, the problem is this, before we get to the numbers, the problem is this. I talked about this in my episode earlier um, this week. When it comes to just pure martial weapon damage classes, it's really difficult to compete with a fighter um, after level 11 because they get an extra attack and that just scales so well and they just leave all of the other damage dealing classes in the dust a little bit um, so for example let's take well okay so so if you were a two-weapon fighter regardless if you were a two-weapon fighter or a two-handed weapon user um, you'd be crazy not to go fighter right to get to level 11 so you could get that extra attack because like I say it scales so well um, but again, as we've shown, right, you're, you're going to get more damage out of that two-handed weapon with Polearm Master and Great Weapon Master than you are with just a dual wielder and the two-weapon fighting style. Um, now, let's say, okay, let's, let's, take, let, let's do some comparisons. 
the great weapon master, polearm master using fighter barbarian that I've done a build on. You guys have seen it. Um, and let's take them at level 14, right? Where you're an 11 fighter and a three barbarian. And compare that to um, a rogue. Well, someone who wanted to do two weapon fighting, you'd want to go to 11 fighter and then three rogue, maybe to get that sneak attack damage and, and wouldn't you be better off? Um, the, the, the great weapon master polearm master fighter barbarian at level 14 against an enemy with 10 armor class is doing 101 damage per round on average and against a 20 armor class it's 60 damage per round um, that same build again that takes three levels of rogue instead of barbarian to maybe get some sneak attack to see if they can't potentially compete um, is 49 damage per round and 34 damage per round against a 20 armor class. It's it's half. It's half the damage. Um, it just it, it doesn't even compare. What if we looked at now? What if we looked at pre-level 11 characters when b before that the fighter kind of starts to pull away from everybody, right? Um, okay, fine. We're going uh, five levels of fighter for the extra attack because you want to get that extra attack, right? If you're a two-weapon fighter or a two-handed weapon user. So five levels of fighter and versus five levels of fighter and three levels of barbarian versus five levels of fighter and three levels of rogue. Um, the gap narrows, but it's still sizable. The fighter barbarian, 65 damage per round against an enemy with a 10 armor class and 32 against a 20 armor class. Uh, the fighter rogue is 36 and 22. The gap is smaller percentage-wise, but it's, it's just not even close. Um, what about level two? <clears throat> you're just, you're level two. You don't even have the extra attack yet. Do, do I compete, right? A level two barbarian um, that just, that, that took a free feat at level one because of, uh, you know, you went custom lineage or, or variant human. So you started with polearm master. Um, that barbarian, thanks to reckless attack and rage, is and and the and getting the polearm master bonus attack, um, is doing 18 damage at a 10 armor class and 10 damage at a 20 armor class, versus the rogue level one fighter level one, starting with the starting with the piercer feet and a plus two dexterity, so you can get your dex to 18. So you're starting with an 18 dex. And you wanted the fighter so you could get the two up in fighting style, right? So you're level two, you're getting sneak attack damage, but you're still, you're close, but you're not quite there. You're 17 damage per round against an enemy with a 10 armor class and eight damage per round against a 20 armor class. Um, at the end of the day, two weapon fighters need something more to the dual wielder feat than just being able to use D8 weapons instead of D6 weapons if they want to keep up with um, the sustained DPR that a two-handed weapon user can get by taking the Polar Master and the Great Weapon Master feats. Now, there is one exception to this rule um, as far as I've been able to find. And, of course, it is for someone using the Shadow Blade spell, right? Shadow Blade, for my money, is the best weapon in the game. Um, and it is a weapon. Yes, it's a spell, but it summons a weapon. Um, you know, there are, sure, at, at low levels of Shadow Blade, when you first get access to it as a level 2 spell, it does 2d8 per damage, or per, per hit, sorry, which is better than even a greatsword. Now, sure, if you had a flame tongue long sword, you know we're comparing one-handed weapons here. A f wouldn't a flame tongue long sword be better than shadow blade? Sure, when you can cast it, you know, at at level three, when you can only cast shadow blade as a second level spell. But as soon as you get to level five and you can upcast it to a third level spell, then it's better. And who has a flame tongue long sword at level three? Your DM is cheating if he's giving you a flame tongue long sword at level three. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's so, so, so strong and it, it, it's, it's very underutilized, I think. Um, so then the question is, who can make the best use of the Shadow Blade? And you know the answer. 
it's the blade singer, right? Because the blade singer gets innate bumps to their armor class and to their ability to main concentration, maintain concentration, which is the shadow blade's greatest weakness. Um, now, what about the Eldritch Knight? I've seen a lot of people ask about an Eldritch Knight and when you're going to do an optimized Eldritch Knight build. Um, I might do one for t for like tankiness, I think, uh, at some point, but for damage, I'm hesitant because I know what I would do, and that's do an Eldritch Knight and take Shadow Blade when you can, and then you know you're pretty good, right? Here's the problem when you compare the Eldritch Knight to the Blade Singer. The Eldritch Knight, <clears throat> you know, by the time they get their third attack at level 11, because that's why you're thinking of take the Eldritch Knight, they get multiple attacks. Now you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get Shadow Blade and you get that third attack, right? But at level 11, when the Eldritch Knight gets that third attack, they can only cast Shadow Blade as, as a second level spell still, meaning that it's only doing 2d8 per swing. And even though you're getting three swings with it, it's 2d8, 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 compared to the Blade Singer, who at that point has access to sixth level spells, and their Shadow Blade is hitting for 4d8 per swing. So even though they're only getting two attacks, they're still doing more overall damage with that Shadow Blade than the Eldritch Knight is outside, of course, of, you know, an action surge. Um, but as you guys know, I'm more interested in sustainable damage than I am in um, bursty, you know, use all my resources damage. Because if you're going to make that argument, you can say, well, you know, the Blade Singer has access to Fireball. And, well, okay, fine, so does the Eldritch Knight. But he has access to, uh, you know, animate objects, which is going to do more damage anyway. Um, so, you know, we're talking just about low resource use, sustainable damage per round. Um, okay, what about when the Eldritch Knight gets um, third level spell slots at level 13? So now their Shadow Blade is doing 3d8 per swing, right? Okay, fine. By then, the um, Blade Singer is, is, can upcast to 5d8 per hit on their Shadow Blade. So, 3d8, 3d8, 3d8 for the Eldritch Knight, plus plus an extra ability score modifier, plus 5, right? I know, they're making an extra attack. Um, compared to, so you're talking 98 plus 5, plus an extra 5, I should say, or 98 plus 15, compared to um, 10d8 plus 10 for the Blade Singer. So if you crunch those numbers, you'll see that they are awash. Let's not niggle over the 0.5 uh, of a point difference, right? Um, it's a wash at level 13. Oh, and by the way, at level 14, the Blade Singer is going to be able to add their intelligence modifier to their attacks. So now they retake the lead and they don't give it up again until maybe level 20 when the Eldritch Knight would get even one more attack, right? Who plays the game at level 20? Nobody. That's who. So. Lesson is Blade Singer wins, and that surprises nobody who's watched this show, right? The real question, the final question, is, okay, fine, how does the martial only focused Blade Singer, they're not using they're not using animate objects, they're not summoning phase, they're just going in with two weapons, one of them is Shadow Blade, and making as many attacks per round as they can do and just being martial and only using their spells for like defensive and utility purposes. It's a fun concept and it's fun to play in game. I've done it. Um, how do they compare to the two-handed, you know, polearm master, great weapon master, fighter barbarian build? <clears throat> if you've seen the graphs, especially the old ones before I did Blade Singer 2.0, you know the answer, right? Um, the Great Weapon Master, Fighter Barbarian, has the edge at lower enemy armor classes, and the Blade Singer has the edge at higher enemy armor classes. Um, and, and, and that's more like medium armor classes if you're fighting in dim light, because then the Blade Singer has advantage, right, with their Shadow Blade on, every, on those Shadow Blade attacks. Um, and that's that's fantastic. Finally, we have at least there's a conversation to be had, right? Who's better? Well, it depends. Instead of who's better, the guy using the two-handed weapon. The end, right? Um, and so, if you want to at least have an interesting conversation about it, this is, as far as I can tell, 
the only way to be competitive. So it's often better, um, and even and and always at least in the conversation, right? Well, it depends. Are you in dim light or darkness? What's your enemy armor class? What's your level? Um, but it's really the only way that I can find to make two weapon fighting um, competitive from a sustained damage standpoint with the two-handed fighting styles, you know, great weapon master, pull arm master, uh, martial classes. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe at the end of the day, this is why I love Bladesinger so much. Um, because they seem to be the only, the only build in the game, really, um, that can use two weapons and still compete with the I hit things hard with my big stick uh, fighters and barbarians of the world. So anyway, that's all I had to say. Um, I, I'm happy to debate this with you guys. If you want to do so in our subreddit or in the comments uh, here, feel free to fight amongst yourselves. If you have an idea for something better, maybe you want to argue that the hex blade could make just as good a use of the shadow blade. Um, I'd debate that, but you know, you might have some valid points regardless. Thanks for watching and uh, you know, love you guys. We'll talk to you soon.